good morning. It's a bright and early morning. I'm off to the Cotswolds today uh, to go and look at a lovely way of providing solar energy to the home. Um, this is from a company called Helio Motion. We'll see more about that later. So this is about 151 miles, it says on my uh, sat at the moment. I think it's actually slightly short than that, but we'll see. Um, we're going to go down and charge on the way, and charge on the way back as well, obviously. Uh, and I've got 200 miles on the range meter at the moment. Um, yeah, let's see how we get on. So this will get better as we go along on this journey, but at the moment we're doing about 40 kilowatt hours per 100 miles, which on a 80 with 84, 85 ish usable battery is uh, going to get us over 200 miles of range. And that's that's paying out quite well at the moment. I started my trip meter when we got to 200 miles of range showing, and I've now done 13.9 miles and it's showing 191 miles, so it's doing pretty well this morning, especially since it's three degrees. Um, this might be a bright sunny day, which has been perfect for demonstrating what I'm going to demonstrate today, but it's uh, three degrees, so uh, it's cold. Um, which is never going to be good for range. I think people really misunderstand um, when people talk about range on, on an electric vehicle. That's almost perfect range. It um, normally measures around about 25 degrees C, which is the perfect temperature for batteries. It's also the temperature that they like to charge the best. So charging figures also tend to be overinflated. Um, so when someone says that a car will charge in 40 minutes, not to 80%. Um, that's usually done at 25 degrees and any other temperature is going to give you a much slower charge rate. Also, it's also going to affect the range as well, so, so, so the quoted range for the DI pace is about 290, I've never got anywhere close to that, but some people have actually, some people have only got 300, but that's based on the smallest wheels at 25 degrees C. So, all of that has an effect, but 3 degrees, you would expect to have a drop off on range. and. The interesting thing is since H264 that drop off has been a lot less for me. Um, I used to get around about 160 to 180 miles um, on, a, on a full charge at, low, at these sort of temperatures. Now I'm, I'm getting a good 200 miles of range. So definitely an improvement and well worth having that, that update. Yeah, so it's gone down quite significantly to 23% of arrival, but I'm actually going to stop the charge now because I've arrived at one of these. I've never been to one of these before. This is an Eon charger. It should work on my Verta card, which I've got somewhere in the car. Because um, but Eon are on the Verta network. You can also use the Eon app. Uh, yeah, let's see how it works. So this is an Eon drive charger. Uh, quite fast CCS charger and also Chatamo. Um, lots of easy ways to use it. You've got to the on RFID tag, or in my case, I'm going to use one of these, which is a Verta tag, um, because they're on the Verta unit, the Verta network. Um, you can use the, the Eon Drive app, contactless payment, or even online payment by scanning that QR code. So, a lot of really simple payment methods. I like that a lot. Um, quite pricey this one, but uh, I'll put the price up on the screen. But other than that, it's very easy to use by looks things. So, let's follow the instructions. good. Let's go back to the screen and see what it says. So it says connect OK, let's press the OK button. And it says what type of payment do you want to use. So I'm going to use an RFID card. You've got the choice obviously of all, all the different options. And in case it on the reader. So let's do that. It's verifying. We're going to charge. So it's very noisy out here, so I'm hoping you can hear me. Set up communication, and we're charging. Excellent. Let's see what charge rate we get. But that looks pretty quick to me. I love this explanation. <laughs> Oh, 
and when you want to stop charging it's just a simple matter of tapping stop on the, the screen. Okay. Just unlock the car. It's a steady wire, which means it should be possible just to unplug it. It's a fairly tight cable, and then obviously make sure you put it away in the box. Now notice that I'm using the CCS charger, not the Chatmo one. Only CCS works with the iPace. Now a successful charger, and let's get back on the road. We're up to 75%, 170 miles of range. Well, actually, probably a bit more than that. I put into Eco, 174 miles of range. That should be plenty enough to get us there. 76 miles to go. Should just get there for 11 o'clock, which is exactly when we're supposed to be getting there, so let's go on. So Melissa, great, great to see you, great to see this at last. We've talked about this quite a few times. We have talked about it several times and it's great that you've made the journey down. So what actually is this? Okay, this is a helium motion system. It's the biggest one we do. It's a PV6 uh, with 72 cell panels and uh, Louise and Richard who put it in were the first people in the country to actually realise it was a great thing and go for it. So what sort of power would this actually do at peak? Uh, right, well that's a very interesting question. It depends on obviously where the, the sun is, leaves and everything else, but we would expect it to generate between 2,400 and 5,000 kilowatt hours a year. Okay, so that's pretty good. Yeah. So, something like that, so one of the tricks of this is it actually follows the sun, doesn't it? It does indeed. So during the day, you can see at the moment the sun is at the east because we're sort of reasonably early in the day. At the end of the day, the panels will end up facing due west, which is over there. So it follows it by moving about every six to seven minutes, virtually imperceptible to the eye. And uh, how's that actually powered? Is that powered off? It's got a slew drive in the back. Okay, so it just turns it. Yeah, and it's the GPS is what actually defines where it's positioned. Okay. And it's very clever because overnight it knows to return to the starting position. So after sunset, it'll rotate backwards ready to be in the right place for the morning. So does that actually use a lot of power to actually no. turn it? No, because obviously it's during the day it's powered by light. So. Yeah. And yes. obviously today is quite a bright day. It's a lovely day today. <laughs> which First is, which, one for some so, time. So you're obviously going to be getting a reasonable amount, amount yes. of power today. What, if it was sort of an overcast, dreary, typical English autumn day, for example... Obviously, you... the, it's a substantial amount less than it is on a good day. You're probably going to get 20% on a bad day in, in comparison with 100% you'll get on a good day. Okay. And so one of the things, obviously, it means you're not putting solar panels on your roof. Yes. Does that have advantages from planning side of things? If you are not in a conservation area and you haven't got a listed building, yeah. um, you can bung one system in without permission. Yeah. If you want to put more than one system in, you have to have permission. Um, if you're in a conservation area or an AONB, then you have to talk to the planners. Because I, I know I, I know several people who've had uh, refused putting solar on the roof. I just yes. wonder if this might be some, an option for them. I think it is a, it's a really good option because if you've got it in your garden and you're not overlooked, then the planners are going to take a, a lot less of a negative view. You're not spoiling the look of a, a listed building. You know, it might be Georgian building. Well, you know, I can understand why they don't want panels on a Georgian building. Um, and if nobody can see it from the road or whatever, it's a much easier discussion to have. Excellent. So, in terms of installing one of these, is, is it a concrete pillar? Or? Yes. Um, I don't know whether you can see the plinth underneath, but it's got a, a meter by meter plinth in which a foundation plate is was sort of floated on the top. You can see the bolts just protruding through the foundation plate. So then the, the column um, bolts to the foundation plate and then the tracking unit is on a separate piece of column and that bolts on to the next bit, all, b all by very, very serious steel bolts. Excellent. So it's not, it's not going to blow over in, in our storm, wonderful storms we've <laughs> As had As you can year. see, having had Storm Chiara and Storm Dennis, there is no damage to it whatsoever. There is an option with a longer rod that if you're worried that the wind's going to be over 80 miles an hour, you can turn it horizontal to, to present the least possible resistance to the wind. And I think Louise and Richard did attach the rod for Storm Chiara, but they didn't for Storm Dennis because the winds were 50 miles an hour as opposed to 80, uh, although the rain was more severe. Indeed. Well, that's good to be thinking about those sort of things. So oh, the, the guys who've invented this have tested it in an island in the Baltic where the weather conditions are far more <laughs> severe than here. Although you might argue that the weather conditions everywhere are catching up, but it is tested to an extremely rigorous level. That's excellent. So, 
you, this is obviously the biggest one. Yes. What other sizes do you? Two panel, three panel, four panel, and six panel. And obviously all scaling down in terms of the peak, peak power. Yes, in general. yes, yes. I mean, in, um, in Scandinavia, where a lot of people have holiday cabins, the three panel is really, really popular because of the fact it's quite narrow because they're all on, uh, they're stacked one on top of each other yeah. and they're uh, landscape rather than portrait. And that seems to be enough to generate enough power for people using a holiday cabin, you know, weekends or whatever. And I haven't seen some of those holiday cabins, you wouldn't want to put solar panels on the roof. No, they're not, they're not strong enough. <laughs> That's strong enough indeed. So this is a really excellent idea. Um, so you, uh, we've seen you also have an app for this as well. So Correct. You can, so you can monitor. Yes, the... so you can log in via the, uh, the inverter and that gives you real-time measurements of what exactly it's uh, producing on a daily basis, monthly, weekly, yearly. So you can see exactly what's going on. So does this come as a package with the inverter and everything else? You can buy it in two different ways. You can buy it as a sort of cut-down kit without the inverter and without the panels, or you can buy it as a total package. Sometimes, if you're getting it installed by uh, a local company, they'll want to actually sell you the panels and the inverter themselves because they'll have them in stock. And in fact, it's cheaper than us shipping them in from uh, Finland. Yeah. Um, so we're relaxed about that. If the installers want to sell the panels, that's absolutely fine. So you could use different panels as well? So you can choose whatever panels you like. Um, there are two different frame sizes for the PV6, so you can choose either standard 60 cell panels or 72 cell panels. And I guess that preacher proves it, proves it as well. It you, does. You've got obviously lots of new types of panels coming on. And they're constantly actually monitoring the panels and actually adapting the frames appropriately. Excellent. That's a really good idea. I, I like it a lot. I think it's genius. That's why I got involved. I mean, I can't understand why, um, in fact, the take-up has been, you know, the awareness has been quite low. We actually won the uh, Build It Best Home Technology Award in 2018, just as it was introduced into the country. So they spotted its potential straight away. But I think last year, with the cessation of the fit and the, the slow um, announcement of the, the replacement, the smart energy generator, I think a lot of sort of domestic consumers were completely worried about the return on investment and actually put their hands back in their pockets rather than releasing cash to pay. So let's, let's just explain that a little bit because FIT was the feeding tariff which yes. was, was, a, was a subsidy effectively for having a, a, a yes. solar generation and the smart energy Generator. generator. That's that's a, a, a tariff effectively for paying you? So the, the FIT was an amount of money that the government gave people as a sort of token gesture against their output. They've now transferred the responsibility to the energy companies. So the energy companies now want to monitor what people are uh, exporting back to the grid and will pay you a modest sum for what you export back. So uh, you can imagine the energy companies aren't particularly keen on that because it slightly nibbles away from their profit margins. But I think it's outrageous the fact that we can generate free electricity and give it to them, which they sell then to other people <laughs> at 13p to 16p a unit. Yeah. It's actually, you know, it's gross profiteering by the electricity companies. So far, five or six have actually announced their SEG rates and Octopus are at the moment the top of the range with 5.6p. Yeah, I, I noticed Octopus are doing a far better deal than most yeah. of the others. Yeah. And, and as we know, most most people who are in my EV group and your EV group are because you drive an MGS. Yes, I do indeed. indeed um, are, are Octopus users because the Octopus Go tariff is so Absolutely. attractive. Absolutely. I really do not understand why the government said you have to pay more than 0p. Why was that? You know, that means they, they could offer 0.1 of a P. <laughs> yeah, that's ridiculous. It makes no sense at all. I guess competition will get in there. I mean, people are going to... Eventually, when people, they want to attract sw switchers, yeah. they'll actually have to put their rates up. Yeah. Especially as the EV market expands. It'd be interesting to see if Octopus go at the agile route, route with the pay in, in tariff as well. <laughs> yes, yeah. It'd be very intriguing, intriguing to see yeah. that, that. There are so many options and so many tariffs, it's actually really difficult to keep an eye on all of them, but um, Octopus at the moment do seem to be winning. But of course that means their customer base is expanding rapidly, which means they've got an infrastructure problem trying to keep up with demand for smart meters and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah indeed. So what or broad price pricing are we looking at for something like this? You're talking about between two and five thousand pounds depending on whether you buy it with the panels, without the panels, with the inverter, without the inverter and the size you're looking at. And that's for the for the unit yes. of the inst installation on top of that? Uh, well if you're quite keen on DIY you can do the bulk of the installation yourself and it was actually designed as a DIY product initially so you know if you can dig a hole if you can mix some concrete, then that 
takes that out of the equation. That'll save you five or six hundred pounds. Um, Putting the kit together itself takes about an hour and a half to two hours. It's like grown-up Meccano, <laughs> Allen keys, etc. Yeah. And I've seen it done, and it's really not a, a major problem. And in fact, if you look at the website, you'll see there's a video of assembly clearly laid out. So if you're, as I say, vaguely competent, all you need to do is put it together, assemble it, put the hole in, fill it with concrete, and then get your electrician who's experienced in solar to come and wire it in and commission it. Brilliant. And it's all done by plugging in a computer with a USB. So in here you've got the tracking unit which actually turns, as you can see it's circular, so it actually is the part that actually turns the system. Here you've got the control board and here you've got the isolator unit. And uh, this is the rod here that controls the angle of the panels and as you can see at the moment they're at a fairly steep angle in the summer the angle will change to be a more shallow angle to uh, actually be more precisely in angle with the sun one thing obviously with this is, is you can take it with you absolutely um, in comparison with roof which is a major problem you've got to have lifting equipment and scaffolding to install it and deinstall it this you can simply undo the bolts and you can deassemble it and then if you move house you can take it with you and reassemble it. Which gets around one of those return investment questions. I, mean, I, I often hear people say, well I won't put it on now because I'm moving it for it for you, it's time. You know, exactly, right? uh, especially for people in their 30s and 40s who may well be in the job market with, you know, moving to another place. It's actually a really good USP. And how does it actually compare to putting it on the roof? In terms of, in terms of output? Yeah. In terms of output we're looking at a between a 30 and 70 percent increase per panel. So in other words you've got six panels here that equals about 10 panels on the roof in an average UK uh, location which we expect to give about 45% extra power. Okay so that definitely is going to affect how quickly you can pay it back. Oh definitely yes yeah really shortens the ROI. Excellent stuff thank you very much Melissa. It's a great pleasure. Oh, what a brilliant chat that was with Melissa and really clever bit of technology uh, solves a lot of issues for people. Um, What's really intriguing with solar at the moment is obviously charging the you know, electric vehicles. I mean, it makes a huge amount of sense to have uh, uh, some form of solar to get effectively get electricity for free. Although obviously there is that initial outcome, uh, outlay, but it's going to make your return on investment a lot quicker if you've got something to charge up. Now, obviously, the, one of the issues there is that sun tends to go in the day. You might want to charge your vehicle. Uh, overnight so that's when battery technology comes into its fore and in the next few years we will have a lot of second life batteries available which hopefully would reduce the power pack cost because at the moment that's quite an expensive cost as Melissa pointed out it's, it's probably more than the cost of the solar um, installation to actually have a power pack a battery pack to store your energy during the day but it's probably still worthwhile if you've got an EV it's certainly interesting. I, lo I love the fact that this thing's movable. Um, you can take it with you. That means you've, you've put out all that investment and you're not relying on the person buying the house from you to, to pay you back, that back. You can take it with you and use it elsewhere. Um, it's actually a, a pretty reasonable DIY install as well. I mean, laying concrete, putting concrete down and, and adding um, and digging a hole and putting concrete down is not a difficult thing to do. Um, if you're just going to need an electrician to wire the final bit in. So in a lot of ways the installation costs are way less than uh, doing it on, on a rooftop. Um, you obviously got the, avoiding the uh, need for things like scaffolding, scaffolding etc. So I think it's a really clever idea. Um, I can certainly see it being used in quite a few places. Now obviously it's going to take a quite big chunk out of land, that size array, but you can have smaller ones. Um, so very interesting thing indeed and uh, hopefully it's uh, helpful for a few people.